you welcome back. Uh, before we are joined by Mr. Chike Chude, I'd like to give you more details about uh, what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, remember that the federal government yesterday blamed the high level of poverty in the country on state governors, who it said operate only in state capitals, pay more attention to building flyovers and airports rather than improvement of life in the rural areas. The Minister of State Budget and National Planning, Clement Agba, made the allegation while fielding questions from state house correspondents at the end of the Federal Executive Council meeting presided over by President Muhammad Buhari at the Council Chamber, Presidential Villa Abuja. Efforts to get governors to speak on the allegation through the Nigerian Governors Forum, Northern Governors Forum, Southern Governors Forum, and other platforms did not yield dividends at the press time. But we all, all know that uh, there will be reactions uh, in the coming days. But for now, that is the accusation that has been left there uh, for people to just see and pick a side if, if they must. Also, the Federal Executive Council has approved a national language policy for use in all primary schools across the country. The Minister of Education, Adamu Adamu, made this known to State House correspondents also at the end of the Council's meeting, which was presided over by President Mohamed Buhari on Wednesday in Abuja. He said... A memo, I'm quoting now, a memo on national policy was approved by the council, so Nigeria has a national language policy and the details will be given later by the ministry. One of the highlights is that the government has agreed now that henceforth instruction in primary schools, the first six years of learning, will be in the mother tongue. According to the minister, the decision is only in principle for now because it will require a lot of work to implement it. These are some of the things that we're, we'll be looking at when uh, Mr. Achike Chude joins us. But let's take another very brief break uh, to enable us to uh, get to Mr. Achike. Or, okay, Mr. Achike is already here. Hello and welcome to the program, Mr. Chude. Yeah, welcome. You're good. Thanks for having me. Okay, uh, let's, let's begin with the first one. The federal government is trading blame and they're saying that whatever is happening in the country, the hardship that we're finding in the country is as a result of uh, what the governors do. And the accusation goes further to say that whatever they do in their states remains in the state capital. What is your take on uh, this accusation by the federal government? Well, maybe, maybe the, the, the first thing would have been to tell them to mind their business and uh, uh, run their own uh, government, run their own, uh, uh, I mean, the way they see fit. And they promise they are going to improve on the economy. Of course, the economy at the level also has a wide-ranging implications everywhere. Um, uh, obviously, they have not been able to do that. And, uh, but that is also not to say that they uh, do the... That, uh, the um, uh, that uh, the government uh, representative, Mr. Agba, is uh, uh, saying uh, something that is uh, absolutely wrong. Of course, there's some truth in it. Uh, but the reality is that uh, if you have failure in governance, uh, you, you know, in a country, then you, could not, you cannot locate that failure just within a particular, uh, you know, sector, within a particular branch of uh, government, you know, or level of government, in this case, the federal government. But there has been failure all around. There has been failure at the center. Uh, there has been failure in the states, and there have been failure at the level of a local government, uh, a local gov governance in the country. So all of this failure. Uh, Mr. Chude, we seem to be losing your audio there. I do hope that uh, we're going to return to Mr. Chude. We cannot hear him anymore. And when he does return, we are going to continue with the discussion. But we're talking right now about the first topic that he is going to handle. Both of them are going to be handled by him. And the topic is that, or the, the thing is that the federal government is saying the level of poverty in Nigeria is because the state governors are not doing what they should do. They concentrate on only the... Um, the urban area, that is the state capital, not even just urban area, because there are some states that have more than one urban area, more than one place that they can call an urban area. So they just concentrate on the state capital and don't go anywhere else. And so the governors need to do more and not just concentrate on the uh, state capitals. That's what the discussion is. And Mr. Chike Chude is trying to uh, throw more light on that and what he feels about what is being said by the federal government. Hello, Mr. Chude, are you still there? 
Uh, it appears we'll just take a, a little break and see how we can get through this technical issue and return in a bit. Don't go away. We're glad to know that Mr. Chude has rejoined us uh, after that technical issue. And um, we were talking uh, about what the federal government is saying, that the state government is uh, responsible for the level of poverty in uh, the country. We are more or less like starting from the beginning. So, Mr. Chude, it's like um, what we hear in the Bible where God asks Adam, uh, what have you done? And Adam said, it's the woman you gave to me. The woman is now saying, is this... The snake that uh, tempted me, I know everybody's trading blames. But yeah. what is your take on the accusation of the federal government? Yeah, well, well absolutely. I think there is something a little bit uh, unsettling, you know, uh, and hypocritical about uh, the, pot, the, the pot calling the kettle black, or the black, or the, you know, or the, or the kettle calling the pot black. But either way, you know, you have um, a, a, a guilt, enough guilt running, going all around to this. Um, uh, in, you know, institutions, whether federal or, or the state. Uh, the reality is that meanwhile, was it not the federal government that promised uh, to uh, give us, um, uh, to provide, uh, to lift about 10 million people out of poverty, you know, on a yearly basis? How many have they been able to lift up out of poverty? So you see a government that has been unable to deliver, that has failed in, uh, you know, in every way uh, to deliver on its economic promises to the people. Uh, now turning around, after seven years, Mind you, after seven years of governance, they now turn back to, they suddenly realize that the reason why the vast majority of people are poor is simply because the states have failed in their obligation of bringing, you know, uh, wealth and prosperity to the rural areas. And it's interesting, really, that they are telling us that um, the major reason is that the states are building infrastructure. At least that's an admission of something positive at the level of the state. And it was also interesting that they didn't mention uh, corruption. Uh, that is also rife in the country, virtually everywhere, that they didn't uh, mention uh, corruption as uh, one of the reasons why uh, the dividends of democracy are not uh, flowing down to the people in the rural area, even in the urban areas. Uh, you know, and obviously, that would, have been, that would have been a very sore you know, talking point because the federal government cannot dissociate itself from the corruption, mind public corruption, that has bedeviled this country in the past seven years. So maybe that was why uh, they delicately scattered away, uh, you know, from that. Uh, but uh, be, be, be that as it may, we are not exonerating uh, the government in any way because there's so much to be done, not just at the level, because it is not just, you know, poverty at the rural, you know, area. And of course, you know that what brought up uh, the whole of this uh, uh, discussion is the fact that uh, the National Bureau of Statistics says that about 63% of uh, Nigerians are living in multidimensional poverty. That's about 133 million of the country's population. That is a very horrendous uh, figure. And uh, so they had to provide uh, a reason why that is happening. And then the state governments, of course, became victims naturally. But the reality is that uh, the federal government has failed. The state government uh, has failed. Obviously, there is so much to be done in the rural areas. Uh, we know, and then once you put, you know, the right kind of um, structure in place in rural areas, you stop people from migrating from the rural areas to the urban areas that are already saturated. There are no jobs and so many other other issues, but definitely the urban areas. You know, so um, it's it's um, it, it's 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 not a, it's a terrible situation. Look at the issue of famine, and I think uh, the government uh, is it the minister talked about uh, the you know situation with famine in uh, many states in the country. Nigeria is rich with arable lands, but for as long as you have, you know, uh, political leadership, governors in these states that are visionless, that are not patriotic and committed uh, to the welfare of the people, it is going to be difficult for them to be able to turn the very rich and uh, natural resources that we have, you know, into um, uh, a, a situation where uh, the vast majority of people can actually begin to get involved in productive activity. And that has been the problem. It is not as if we do not have the working the population, the youthful population, that have the energy to work. But unfortunately, the enabling environment you know, uh, being created is not just adequate. In most cases, it is, not any, it is non-existent. And so between the state government and the federal government, you have to hold uh, these people responsible. The local government, to some extent, you can try to exonerate the local government in the sense that uh, local, local governance is something that has been sabotaged over the years by the governors. 
uh, you know, who have subverted the constitutional provision, you know, of a local government in the country, you know, and are now running it the way they see fit. So that is the only reason I'm, I'm exonerating the local, you know, government because we do not have independent local governments in the country. So the blame lies squarely with the federal government and the state government. But beyond that, again, is the fact that when you are looking at macroeconomic indices, macroeconomic indices is usually within the purview of the government. You have the Ministry of Finance that is involved with the overall national planning, you know, of the country, working in tandem with the CBN that's in charge of monetary, you know, policy. All of these things have a lot to bear on an economy. Look at the issue of, for instance, of uh, the pressure on the foreign exchange. It is as a result of the failure of government to either build refineries, you know, or to uh, uh, repair the old refineries. So the government, the country continues to spend so much money, you know, to import foreign exchange that we don't have, to import uh, refined petroleum products into the country, putting pressure on the Naira itself. So all of this is, and then how productive, what are the kind of policies, productive policies that, that we have in this country that will take away, uh, you know, the unemployed youths, so many of them that are over 35% unemployed youths in the country, take them away from unemployment into meaningful employment. Uh, you know, this is not happening because what we are having is the in the in this trailer, in the uh, deindustrialization of, you know, the, the productive sector of uh, this country. And so we have, you know, all of these things. And so that's why I'm saying that. A large chunk of the, the problem, the blame, you know, would lie with the government, with the federal government at the center, but the state government are also culpable, you know, for the misuse of the funds that have been, you know, in their hands, some of them outrightly being stolen. And so if they are now building infrastructure, I would say that that is a good, that is good. You know, and that, that should not be a negative. After all, the federal government has complained about the state government, government is building infrastructure. Have when you ask them what has happened with the money, the Abacha loot and some of these other the monies that, that they have handled over the years, they will tell you that they were able to put infrastructure on ground. So if they agree that when it comes to them, infrastructure is not a bad thing, why would infrastructure be bad when it comes to a state government? Okay, well, like I said, it's not just let, let me try to the play the devil's let me try to play the devil's advocate here. Uh, and in fairness to the federal government. Every month, the state governors go cap in hand, as it were, to collect a location and come back to their states. And what the federal government is saying is that whatever money is spent, which maybe is not as much as they collect, is only done in the state capitals. So it's like a form of eye service. And you have said yourself that uh, over the years, the... Uh, um, local government system has been has been bastardized, has been killed by the actions of the governors themselves. And even the federal government we know has given this autonomy, has made pronouncements for the auto autonomy of these local governments. And the state governors seem to be sabotaging whatever is pro constitutionally provided for uh, the local governments. So can't the blame squarely just rest on the state governors, knowing that the federal government pay, plays its part and expects them to be the people that are closest to the, uh, to the people that need this poverty alleviation, that need these programs that will make them better uh, or, or will make their lives better wherever they are living? Yeah, yeah. yeah we look, the, the governors across board, across you know, political parties, across all the geopolitical zones in this country, they stand indicted for their stance you know, over the local government, the autonomy for the local government, because they are selfish, you know, and uh, uh, that shows that, um, uh, it, 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 uh, of course, there's everything wrong about uh, their attitude towards the local governance in the country. They want everything to be under their apron strings. They want to be the, you know, the ones to dictate what happens even at the local government uh, level. And that's one of the most important uh, tires of government. Because that is the one that is closest to the people. But there's, there seems to be some level of uh, hypocrisy here. Because you also have a situation where even this money you talk about, that state, state governments go to the uh, federal government every month, cap in hand, to beg for money from uh, the you know, um, federal allocation. And the question you need to ask is, where are these monies coming from? These monies are coming from states. They are not being generated by the federal government. They are being generated you know, from certain states in this country. Uh, you, you know. and, so, and that's why... I mean, right now, the federal government has about uh, maybe is it over 60-something items on the exclusive list. Some of these items on the list do not have anything to do, should not have anything to do with the government when you are running a federation. And that's why people have been talking about the uh, true federalism.
Because, you see, what you need, and that's why I keep on saying that uh, the model, the economic model that is being run, or the federation model that is being run in this country, is being run in the wrong way. In the sense that, you know, rather than the government appropriating, you know, what happens in most of the states, the resources in most of the states in the country, and taking it to the center, then the states have to come to the center to beg for them. You know, the federal, you could have a situation where we have, you know, requisite some of, you know, uh, uh, some of, I mean, this situation is changed, where the states now can now truly own the assets and the resources within their territories, and then pay, you know, and as these assets are exploited, you know, and ex are, are they exploit, they can now pay, you know, charges, uh, you know, or levies or taxes to the federal government. So you can imagine, being that virtually every state in this country is blessed, with one mineral resources, major mineral resources or the other. You can imagine a situation where virtually all the states are paying maybe 10 or 20 percent each to the federal coffers. And then so you have a federal government that is awash with, with cash. And then you have state governments that are controlling about 70 or 80 percent of the resources from their states. So you also have state governments that are also awash with money. And you know, and so if it becomes a win-win situation, both the states and the federal government you know, ultimately at the end of the day. So this is the model we're talking about. But then beyond what we're, what we're even beyond that is the fact that some of that, many of these states are in a position to adequately, properly cater for the benefit of their citizens. But it's simply because of the misappropriation of the funds, of the resources of these states, that is why there's so much poverty. That's why we're now talking about 133 million Nigerians living in multidimensional, you know, poverty. So the federal government should up its game should do its own part you know, in ensuring that you know the major economic control that the government has in terms of uh, you know macroeconomic you know dynamics and all the other the financial you know regulation and all that are also in place and that they also that the power sector too that is also critical for generating employment is also you know uh, 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 put in place not just this uh, miserly 3.5 thousand you know uh, megawatts of uh, of um, electricity that we that, that, that we are producing on a daily basis. So the, obviously the country cannot move forward if we don't change, you know, the narrative. If we don't change the basis, you know, on which you know, I mean, the, the infrastructure on which our economy, you know, is sitting on. Okay. Uh, well, but in fairness, before before we move to the second topic, you are supposed to handle. Uh, do you think that if the states are really made to function as in a federating unit, uh, they will perform better than they are performing now. Because why I'm saying this is one of the greatest controversies that are, or the greatest uh, problems that has come up now uh, is the, the revelation by the River State Governor about the amount of money that was given to every state and how he used his own to do whatever he did. Like we had a time when almost every day he was um, commissioning one project or the other and he said this, there was a particular kind of money, a particular amount of money that came to the state and it went to all other states. It made some people even protest against their own state governors. One, a case in point is the current uh, vice presidential candidate of uh, the People's Democratic Party where people from his state, Delta State, were protesting in Abuja to come and that he should come and give account of that kind of money if a governor has revealed this and there is nothing to show in their state that this money was ever paid. So do you think that having the power over the mineral resources that are in their states will make any difference knowing how politics is played in our country today? No, there are no guarantees. I cannot give these guarantees because we already know the nature of our politicians, the character of those people who govern us. I have maintained that these people are not patriotic. You know, they are not committed uh, to national development. All they are interested in is satiating parochial, you know, primordial interests. That is themselves and their families. That is what happens. That's why the vast majority of our youths are escaping from the country because there is no feeling of hope. You know, and no, no expectations that greater things or good things will happen in the country. Of course, you also know that the children of these uh, elites are, you know, schooling abroad, are going to the best educational institutions in the world. And they will also know that uh, access to health facilities, uh, to the best, you know, uh, medical facilities, 
you know, uh, is abroad. And so they, they, they and their wards and their families are the ones that access this thing. So that shows you, you know, the, 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 the level of thinking of the political elite. So, and they say that to whom much is given, much is expected. So if you are found wanting in small things, definitely you'll be found wanting in big things. And because they have failed in small things, even if you give them something bigger, they are surely going to fail. But then the issue, the question you ask is this. So you now have the federal government also playing a role in terms of uh, managing the resources of this country. In what way has this federal government also been able to account for all the resources that have been made available to it? Is it not under the same federal you know, government that we are having a situation where 700, a situation of 700,000 food barriers of crude oil, what about $70 billion are being stolen on a daily basis? So who is going to build the cat? Who is, is, is that's why I, I use the expression, the pot calling the kettle black, because they are all in the same category, whether it's at the state level or whether it is at the federal level, the people that have been entrusted with responsibility have not been able to live up to this responsibility. So it becomes a, a, a we are in a nightmare situation between the devil and the deep blue sea. You know, so where do you go to? To the center for salvation or to the states for redemption? That neither is actually going to happen. And that's why we everybody is talking about a proper different political process that will lead hopefully, you know, to the to the within a way of the people who have been in power and who have shown that have not shown anything meaningful to account for the position of responsibility they have held over the years. So it's a difficult situation that we find ourselves in. But there is no way you point to and you find angels and you find sense in all of those places. Most of them, especially the political actors right now, are all stained. And, and, and so I cannot tell, but I'm only telling you about a structure that will be equitable, a structure that will be just, a structure that will make sense. And that is to ensure that people who are generating certain resources of this country are Thank benefiting from the resources of this country while making their obligations, their financial obligations to the center. Uh, you know, so that they will, you know, uh, be the ones to now call their leadership, their political leadership at the local level to order. And it is easier, actually, for them to come within, you know, their states to hold their leaders okay. more accountable okay. than even perhaps even the center. All right. Uh, well, it's it's a whole new um, ground that we need to cover when we're talking about whether the states will perform better as a good federation if we, our country uh, becomes a good federation or a, a proper federation as it should be. But let's move to the second topic. And very briefly now, because the time is almost up. So in a few sentences, uh, the Federal Executive Council yesterday approved a new national language policy for primary schools. The policy makes mother tongue a compulsory medium of instruction from primary one to six. What significance is this introduction in your own opinion? How no, I, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is good. It is. It is significant, and I think it is. Um, it is. It is proactive, uh, in the sense that um, you know, if you if you listen to, I think um, the United Nations Agency, the Uni, UNICEF, one of the United Nations Agency that is also, uh, you know, promoting, uh, you know, the practice of indigenous languages that are seeking to that is seeking to protect indigenous languages. You realize that uh, they, from time to time, they sound the alarm, you know, on the danger or the threats that are facing indigenous languages all over the world. And of course, you know that a lot of them have been swallowed up by other, 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 other you know, language uh, groups. And, and so, uh, in the language is one of the most important aspects of our culture. In fact, our culture, the, the entirety of culture, our culture is all about language. Because language contains the history, the values, you know, and the, the I mean the, the origins and the, the practices of a people. And so I think it's a good thing. But you know, what we should be looking at really beyond that is how you know they came up with this policy. Who did they consult with? You know, did they engage the public? Or is it just a few people sitting down somewhere in a room and coming Well, up well they, 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 have, they have said the, the details are not out yet, uh, as it is. They have made a pronouncement before even thinking about the details that should come. But what worries uh, some of us is the fact that, okay, if I have a child in Yoruba land, I don't speak yeah. Yoruba, I'm not from Yoruba, but yeah. the predominant yeah. language in Yoruba land yeah. definitely is Yoruba. So my child gets to speak Yoruba, learn the values that you have talked about of the Yoruba people. 
people and my own uh, values, my own traditions, my own language cannot be learned because I live in Yoruba land. Secondly, the fact that in Nigeria we have so many languages, for instance, if you go to Cross River State, almost every local government has a language of its own. I'm not talking about dialect, a language. In fact, it's so bad that in a, lo a particular local government, some, in some villages, the women speak differently from the men. So in this kind of a case, don't you think there will be a little bit of confusion? In no, the it's, first not, it's not going to be a little bit of confusion. It's a lot of confusion. Look, I was also <laughs> getting there. That was why I was talking about Because when you are coming up with a policy, there are so many things you consider. You also have to bring, you also have to identify the stakeholders. Who are the people? What do we want to you know, achieve? You know, and then so you're going to bring people from across board. And these are people that some will raise objections, some will give reasons why they think it will not work, some will give reasons why it will work, just like the example you have given. You know, uh, though that does not exonerate the, the family itself, because from the analogy you gave, you try to exonerate the role and the duties of parents, you know, so inculcating their, you know, culture in their children. It's important that, that these things start from the home. In fact, the teachers, teachers are supposed to be the first, or parents are supposed to be the very first teachers of their children before they go outside. So what they learn outside is a different thing from what they learn, you know, in the home, in terms of values, in terms of the culture, and all of that. So we must do that. But then the problem is this. You know, that's why the minister, just like you said, also said, well, if it is going to take a bit of time. If it is going to take a bit of time to begin the implementation, then don't talk about it. Then don't bring it up as a policy. And then now tell us, yes, we want to, this is what we intend to do, but we don't have the teachers, we don't have you know, the, the textbooks that are needed, you know, for this purpose. We want to start working on them. Then after we have worked on them, we can now begin. So in principle, this is the policy that we have passed. That in itself doesn't make sense. I don't understand what they are trying to achieve, you know, uh, by that. But there are issues. Over 350, 380 languages in the country. So what are you going to... So by the time you have finished the first set of teaching, maybe okay. from primary one to primary six, All right. and they are used to certain terms, okay, you know, uh, well, no, no, no. I, I just wanted you to land because uh, time is up, and I want us to just wrap it up. Okay, okay. So, so, so quickly. So, you know, so by the time you have taught all of these people, you know, uh, terms in the indigenous languages and so on, and then you now take them, for instance, something like uh, maybe chemistry uh, and all these other terms, nickel and the rest. By the time you have taught them this in indigenous languages, by the time they now get into the secondary school, you're not going to change all those terms to English. How are you now going to? Uh, communicate the same thing. How would they now be able to know that this is what we identify as this, <laughs> as oxygen, one. for instance, as helium, as gas, and all that. So these are some of these. So it needs a lot of fine tuning. It needs a lot of work. Okay. It's just too early to announce it to the Nigerian public. Exactly. Uh, well, I <laughs> would like to thank you, Mr. Chude, for coming on the show. As usual, it's always uh, fire for fire when we're talking with you. Thank you so much for being a part of the program thank today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So we're talking with Mr. Achike Chude on two uh, topics. First of all, the federal government lays all the blame of poverty on the state governors. They say because they don't do what they're supposed to do, poverty has entered the uh, rural communities. And so that's why 75% of Nigerians who live in the rural areas are poor. So the blame is on the governors. And then the second thing is that the federal government has come out to say that uh, indigenous languages will be used to teach in the first years of instructions of uh, uh, pupils in school, from primary one to six, they will be using um, the local language. Uh, they didn't factor in the fact that we have nursery schools where children graduate into primary school and then they, before they become uh, graduates, um, they become secondary school students. So what language would be taught in the nursery school? And after that, if it is English that is taught in nursery school, then they, break, they take a break and go to indigenous language in primary school and then go back to English language. Some things do not just add up. And like Mr. Chude said, maybe the government should sit down and have a rethink before they make a pronouncement. We're going to take a short break and return with a yet another guest who will be talking on something else. Stay with us. <laughs>